system are and the system what but you know all that so well it's it's worth sharing and i'll call on you to discuss that with that said we're going to jump right in with our webinar people will continue to join uh, i'm going to mute everyone right now because uh, occasionally people have their they're talking in the background uh, the goal of this webinar is to educate and teach and share all of our free resources with you. So when you leave the webinar, you know what to do next. You, you, have, a, you have a plan. Uh, as everyone knows, we record these webinars. So if you want to watch it again, we're going to send it to you. Also, as you have questions, we encourage you to list them in the chat. Our team will respond. We have Scott Laney, uh, Scott Brown, Sam Mangella is not uh, with us today, but our team is equipped uh, to respond. Some people have said, hey, I, I don't want to be public yet or I really want to talk about it. Can I join anonymously? The answer is, of course. If you don't want to ask a question, ask it in chat. We'll respond. We're a community. We want to help. We want you to engage to the degree that you are comfortable. Some reminders uh, as we get uh, going. While we give away all of these free resources, it really works if you continue to do the work. And all so many of you I've learned from, you're successful, you've built businesses, you've educated people, you've trained. Traversing the system successfully, it's really the, the same thing, applying that same skill set and critical thinking skills in this direction. But people have said, well, I knew what I was doing in my business. I don't know what to do now. And that kind of happened yesterday with someone who attended our webinar. They've attended many webinars. And they're actually in the pre-sentencing process. And I'm going to touch on pre-sentencing for a few minutes, and then I'll transition over to, to Kent. Now, some of you may be thinking, I've already been sentenced. This is a post-sentencing webinar. Why are you going to cover something if I've already been sentenced? Don't waste my time. We're not here to waste anyone's time, but I want you to understand if you're leading up to sentencing, things that you can do, and if you've been sentenced already, how you could recreate the record moving forward if you're not pleased with what happened in your probation report or your sentencing report. So our team discusses at length uh, the mitigation arc and as you're traversing this arc, and we want you to emerge on the other arc, other side of the arc successfully with a plan, with your dignity. And that really stems from what you do, to do today, tomorrow, and so on. So someone reached out yesterday and said, I love the webinars. I attend them. Like, what would you do next if you were me? Like, what's the next step? It's so overwhelming. And my response was, I'd encourage you and then I encourage this person to spend time going through our free resources on prison professors. 10, 15, 20 minutes a day. On every webinar I mentioned, when I met Michael in prison and I was so overwhelmed with how am I going to rebuild my reputation? I've lost my licenses. I'll never make three cents again. I'm in prison. I've embarrassed my family. I've got $500,000 in restitution. Like, I, I, it's too overwhelming. I don't know where to begin. Then he introduced me to slow and steady wins the race, the tortoise and the hare. And he said, let's just make progress every day. And if you can't do it every day, do it for a half a day. If you can't do it for half a day, do it for an hour. What can you do in the next 15 minutes? That was very transformative for me. As many of you know, Michael's my mentor and partner, but I strive to be the ambassador of his message because it's transformative. And he has created so much content for all of you at no charge. So I tell all of you, as I told this person who reached out after the webinar, go through our resource page, but start with earning freedom. Certainly you can buy the paperback book if you like. All the resources go to our nonprofit or download the book for free. Or even better, if you're running or driving in your car or on a train, listen to Michael narrate the book. Listen to the journey of 26 years through prison and how he deliberately every single day created a path that helped that put us in a position to train and inspire so many people. So I encourage all of you, what would I do next if you are unsure? Go to iTunes, listen to episode 1.1 and then 1.2. If you can't allocate 15 to 20 to 30 minutes a day to prepare for prison or sentencing or probation, that's a separate conversation that we need to have because it's not just showing up for this webinar and then doing nothing next week and the week after that. We want to teach you to advocate how to be best in class. And that really starts with, forgive me, that really starts with understanding the system and the stakeholders and these resources We'll get you there. So I will ask Scott Laney, if you would, Scott, on prisonprofessors.com, if you would put this link to Earning Freedom in chat. And I encourage all of you to spend 10, 15 minutes a day listening to that end. Jason Larry, who's on the call. Jason, we don't need a whole summary of the book and all this and that, but I know you read Earning Freedom. Can you just give a quick summary of why you found the book helpful and why you think others in our community, at no cost to them other than their time, should consider listening or reading the book? 
down. I um, it was such an enlightening piece for me, and I listened to it every day. As a matter of fact, uh, I uh, asked you even was lesson from freedom, but lessons uh that you had in prison. It was that also on on audio book, but. I, I read yours and I listened to the other one, but um, Michael Santos's his, his journey, and that's that's what I've learned to call it now. His journey through all of what he uh, was able to do with 26 years of incarceration, and not and had the opportunity to to not get into trouble and to stay out of people's way and to most of all earn his way back into society uh, through his own hard work. Um, and as I told him, uh, you know, two minutes ago, Carol's the real hero too. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, moving 26 times or, or 20, maybe, maybe 24, 25 times in different prisons and, um, you know, uh, being able to make sure she stayed next to him and, and kept everything going. But the long and the short of it is that he was able to endure decades decades of being incarcerated with the most violent people on the planet and then he moved from that to be able to still own lane do his writings learn earn a degree then turn around and earn a master's degree while he's actually incarcerated and and, and probably would have had a phd had they not blocked him in some in some other areas um, but obviously the man is a genius his intestinal fortitude cannot be matched even even his physicality with regards to uh, running inside prison and keeping his things, uh, keeping his head together. But the long and the short of it is that he emerged a better person, a better professional, a better Christian, a better husband than he was before. I appreciate you sharing that. And Michael's flying back right now from the Midwest. And occasionally he jokes that, uh, I don't need self. I don't need self promotion. This isn't about me and stroking my ego. I'm not stroking his ego, but rather sharing the strategies that guided him through 26 years in custody. So if it's six months or a year and a day or three or four years, someone texted this morning. They're on the webinar for the first time. They're getting ready to go in for five years with three young children. What strategies can they put in place to get through? It's going to require deliberate work every single day. And if I were you, and I was you, and I was alongside Michael Santos while he wrote Earning Freedom, and I was privileged enough to read it as he was writing it, I'd invest 20, 30 minutes a day listening to each chapter. You'll be further ahead. No doubt. Please, please go through our resources. I'm begging you. They're free. It's just your time. Now, as we transition to sentencing for a moment, I'm going to call on Kent in a moment and reiterate the obvious. I know many of you regretted how you prepared for sentencing. Many of you were not prepared for your probation interview. Your lawyer might have said it's a 10 or 15 minute interview. No big deal. Show up and answer questions. You might not have got the sentence that you expected. And in re you may look back in retrospect and say, wow, I wish I would do things differently. We don't ever want you to move forward and then look back and say, I want to do things differently. We don't want any of you to speak about us the way so many people speak about their lawyers, which is why we're here. But if you've yet to be sentenced, I want to identify the obvious and to articulate that message, I will refer to subject matter experts we have interviewed, like Judge Boo and Judge Bennett, Chris Maloney, a subject matter expert who ran federal probation. And they all say, and you can watch the interviews, they're on our subject matter expert page on Prison Professor Scott. In fact, I'd be grateful if you would post in the chat the subject matter expert page link, because you need to watch all of these videos. Even if you've been sentenced, you need to watch the interview with the judge because they talk about post-sentencing matters. All of the judges and subject matter experts say the lion's share of the work has to come from you, the defendant. Number one is the defendant. Number two is the lawyer. Number three is friends and family. So you've got to identify with victims, articulate your remorse, share lessons learned, and articulate a plan moving forward. One thing I want to stress is the value of being authentic of true authenticity and even being vulnerable as you share all of the details of your life. What I mean is there are people on this webinar who have said, I did a horrific job of preparing for sentencing. What do I do next? Own it. Talk about it. Acknowledge in your release plan, which we will cover at the end of this webinar, address in the release plan that you didn't fully get it at your sentencing hearing. You didn't fully understand the ramifications, yet it was spending time in prison away from your family time to think, time in memorial that helped you understand how devastating your actions were. And it's not about me, it's about making amends. When I came home from prison, Michael was still in prison. Carol Santos and I were working to grow this business. I had nothing to do, so I attended sentencing hearings. 
And judges frequently say the same thing. Judge Selma, who just gave Michael Avenatti 14 years, Judge Carter, Judge Wilson, my sentencing judge, Judge Gutierrez in Los Angeles, many of them say the same thing. I think you're telling me what I want to hear. I think you're sorry because you got caught. I think if I give you the outcome that you want, you're not going to follow through on the promises that you are making to me today because you're telling me, you're not showing me. Judge Gutierrez loves to say to white collar criminals, I don't think this is the only time you've done it. I think this is the only time that you've got caught and you've given me no reason to see you differently. Prove me wrong. So the way that you can prove them wrong isn't by telling them or a case manager, it's by doing, it's by showing, it's by writing, it's by developing a new record that shows that you're different than the government's version of events. Only you can do that work and we're giving all of that to you, but you've got to invest the time. I share that because if you don't like that pre-sentence interview, own it, work to change it because it was Chris Maloney with whom Michael Santos interviewed, former head of federal probation who told Michael in an interview you can watch, the first thing that probation officer is going to do, the probation officer that you're gonna to want to let you travel, have higher levels of liberty, perhaps work as an entrepreneur instead of getting a minimum wage job at KFC, all work is honorable, but I know you don't wanna work at KFC. What's the likelihood that you get that approved? Well, Chris Maloney said that probation officer is gonna read the pro probation report that you might've done a year, two, four, five years earlier. And if that report is in best in class that identifies with victims, it, if it does not have your personal narrative in there, if it doesn't demonstrate what you're doing to become better, are you weaker or are you stronger? It's a pretty obvious answer. So you need to begin correcting the record today, or if you've yet to be sentenced, invest in that pre-sentence interview and sentencing, create the right message. To that end, I wanna spend two minutes on Kent, who was recently sentenced. And I know you spoke last week, Kent, so you don't need to cover everything again, but I'd like to, you to give a summary of how the work you put into place could have helped you at sentencing. Then I wanna share one specific thing Kent did to nurture his network through a tough time. So Kent, thank you for contributing. Yeah, for sure. Good morning, everybody. So um, I'll kind of cut right to the chase and happy to answer any questions or happy to talk to anybody about it. And to echo what you said, Justin, I think it's easy to, to write down or say the words and I, and I think the evidence that when I got for my, my judge at sentencing was the fact that I did do the action and had proof that I did do the action. So um, to be kind of brief about what happened is I got indicted in September of 2019, ended up finding Justin and the team about a year or so later and started spinning my, my mindset and my actions. I was kind of pretty depressed, angry, sad, ready to fight all those different kind of feelings and had a lot of different stuff going on. But ended up making the decision that this was happening and and started to kind of plan my life um, for the second half of kind of after this whole world and how to get the best outcome, but plan for the future. And ended up getting sentenced this past November 9th. Um, the government was asking for 57 to 71 months and ended up getting sentenced to 15. And then earlier this week, I got my designation letter and I'm going to be surrendering to the Morgantown prison camp on December 27th. So th thank you for sharing that. And I want to share something that all of you need to do and something that Kent did well. And I'm going to share a story that inspired me and you can learn from it. Now, if you read Michael's work, uh, you'll read about some of his goals in prison, including nurturing relationships. He used this analogy in his book, My Day, My 8,394 Day in Prison, where he felt like a fisherman akin at sea, casting lines with hope that people would bite, writing hundreds of letters. I used to ask him, what it's like to what is it like to write a letter knowing somebody may not respond? He says, I'm doing the work, I'm improving my writing skills. And I assure you, I believe that sometimes someone's going to respond, and I don't need everyone to respond. I need a few people to respond, and I'm going to prove worthy of that love and support. I share this because our team has worked with people compiling character reference letters as you prepare for sentencing or a licensing hearing. We've worked with doctors and, and lawyers who are trying to get their license back and they need character reference letters. They have to update their narrative. And as we're going through that process, some people in that, the network have said, I kind of feel used by so-and-so. I only hear from them when they need something. I got a call out of the blue that he needed a character reference letter. Now he's home from prison and he calls me for a job or he needs another letter because he's trying to keep his real estate license. I feel kind of used. like he, And it kind of aligns with the message of the judge. You're sorry because you got caught. You know, you kind of reach out when you need something. 
How can you change that? Well, you nurture relationships every single day, prove worthy of the people who chose to write you a character reference letter, stay in touch with them and share your journey with them. And to that end, Kent, if you don't mind sharing, Kent was on a budget going through a difficult time in Ohio, yet when Kent learned that he may be under, that a guilty plea may be coming, he was employed. Kent, walk everyone through what you did at great expense to maintain a relationship. Yeah, so I ended up, uh, I was in healthcare sales and was getting ready to take a plea for healthcare fraud. So my current employer at the time, they were willing to hang on to me because I had done nice work and had no issues with them, but um, they were kind of going down the road of innocent until proven guilty during my indictment, which was great. So it allowed me to keep working. But when I decided that I was going to have to take this plea, I ended up jumping on a plane and flew out to Los Angeles where my employer was to sit him down face to face and tell him that I'm going to be taking a plea. And knew pretty much that that was going to be the end of it, that they were going to end up having to let me go, um, but wanted to make sure that I kept a, a good working relationship with them and ultimately ended up getting a, a character reference letter from the COO of the laboratory that I was working with that she wrote. In, and I don't know if it influenced the judge a lot or a little, uh, and I've talked about this a few times on these webinars. I don't think you ever, ever really know what impacts the most. I think you just should do all the work uh, and kind of cover all your bases. But this letter in particular talked about um, how honest and upfront I was and that if she could work with me again, she wishes she could. And it was a really well written letter and it wasn't from a family or a friend. This was from an employer that had hired me and worked with me both during my indictment and then was writing to me after my plea. So even the timing of it was a really nice, was a nice letter to, to, to submit to the judge at the same time. We're speculating, of course, we'll never know, but those are the types of letters, by the way, that lead to shorter prison terms. It speaks to integrity of transparency of disclosure. I think it's fantastic. And it's no secret Kent got a better outcome. Now, as we transition to the second part of this webinar, I want to discuss the first 30 days in prison. And of course, as Michael likes to say, discussing the first 30 days or week in prison is sort of like moving to China. What do I need to know? It could go on for days. So we're going to go over a brief summary of it. We have resources that will guide you, including our top 10 tips of surrendering to prison. And as I like to say in every webinar, if you have not watched the prior webinars, you're not ready for prison. If you haven't watched the webinars on disciplinary infractions, you're not ready. If you haven't watched the top 10 tips to surrendering to prison, you're not ready. If you don't fully understand the First Step Act and things that you need to do upon your surrender to prison to ensure that you are qualifying for the First Step Act and enrollment in programming, you're not ready. So Scott, I'll also ask you to put up a link, if you would, to all of our prior webinars in the chat, because that's what it takes to be successful. Every now and again, someone in the webinar will text me and say, hey, great webinar, but let me be really clear. My job is to get out of, I want to get out of prison early. I want to get home to my family. I'm not naive. I've been to prison. I understand the objective of wanting to get out early. If that's the goal, you have to avoid problems and disciplinary infractions and making decisions that can really derail your life. Of course, our team wants you to do more. We want you to be productive, nurture your network, repair your reputation. But if the goal is only to get out and do nothing else, that's your choice. You still have to avoid problems. Watch the webinar on how to avoid problems in prison. Someone, unfortunately, who is not part of our community didn't watch that webinar because I received a very distressed call from a wife to tell me that her husband surrendered to prison. He was a physician, I believe. He was in quarantine for four days, fully vaccinated. They kept him in for, for four days. And one of his goals in prison, like many people's goals in prison, was to lose weight. She said he wanted to lose like 75 to 80 pounds. And he began to tell everyone this goal in prison. I want to lose weight. This is like a fat farm. This is big boy timeout. This is fantastic. Forgetting that this is federal prison, embracing this mantra that perhaps this is a club fed. It's federal prison with people who have been in and out of the system for decades. And it's naive to think because you don't see barbed wire or fences that it's party time. So in this case, he talked about the weight he wanted to lose. He was in, invited to attend an exercise class, which is very common in, in prison. I attended some. He attends the class. At the end of the class, he goes on and on about how phenomenal this class is, better than the trainers he had back at home. And the prisoner sensed an opportunity and essentially said something akin to, really glad you like it. We'll help you. It's 50 bucks a month for the class. 
And he's like, well, I just thought it was a free class and I don't really want to pay you the $50 a month. And the guy said, yeah, it's $50 a month, man. It's 50 bucks a month. So what I, well, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a list. What I want you to buy for me in the commissary, you're going to buy it. You're just going to put it on my rack, 50 bucks a month. And the guy didn't want to do it. He said, no, I'm not comfortable doing that. I don't, I'm not going to do that. So he got quiet real quick. And within a week, his wife said an iPhone was found in his locker. She claims, and I believe her, that she, he was set up. And just like that, a grandfather looking to have a productive journey in prison and lose 75 pounds is sitting in the hole, written up for an iPhone charge. If he gets out, he'll look like Casper the ghost. He may lose the good time and he may get transferred. That is a horrific story about not being prepared for prison, of trying to manipulate the environment before understanding the environment. Watch our webinars because you can't write a book and repair your reputation and do everything it is you want to do if you're making really bad decisions. And of course, the wife's distraught. Why? Because prison's harder on those that love and support us. Nurture it. Avoid problems. Review and study our work. It's hard. Counter that with someone who watched our webinars and read Earning Freedom. And this is someone who's in prison with like four young children. He only attended two webinars, was not a client of ours, didn't pay us a penny, but he read Earning Freedom. And with young children, he and it gets chills to even mention it, he laid out this plan where he wrote 10 letters to his children that he wanted them to read every single day, the first 10 days in federal prison. And it was so inspiring. And the wife reached out and she kind of read one of the messages. And but essentially, she shared with me details of day four, his fourth day in prison, the wife, and they may be going through a divorce. It's very tough, but she's supportive of the children. They read this letter together, and it was something analogous to today's my fourth day in prison, and I miss you. And I want to let you know what I've done today. I've gotten up early. I've done my job. I've exercised. I'm reading a book. I'm proving worthy of the love and support that that you're giving to me. I'm not wasting time. I'm not watching the Kardashians or Sons of Anarchy. I'm not complaining. I'm so grateful that you're standing alongside me. Please open up my letter tomorrow. And never have they felt so connected. I want you to assess how they adjusted to prison, the message that they're giving their family. One grandmother is totally distraught. Her husband's in the hole for an iPhone charge. The other is saying, wow, he's inspiring our family. I'm not happy that he's there, but I'm proud of him. Which path do you want to go down? If you want to go down the, the better path, it's going to require you to embrace some discomfort. To that end, let's make this interactive. In prison, there are things that you can and cannot control. Someone who's going to prison, would you mind sharing with me or someone who's been to prison? What are some things you can and cannot control in prison? And now I feel like I'm going back to prison having a conversation with Michael Santos. But would someone be willing to engage me what you can and cannot control in prison? Is there anyone that can jump in? Justin, I'll yes. start out with something. Yes. Um, I'd say one of the biggest things that, that you can control uh, that I try to work on every day is you can control how you respond to the things that are out of your control. And there will be far more out of your control than you anticipate. And one of those is not complaining to family, not complaining to the inmates you're with, because you can't, if you can't change it, what good is, is the whining and the complaining going to do? That's right. You can't, you may not be able to control your, your job. Now, our team, as we talk about the first 30 days in prison, before you clear a &O, admissions and orientation, we want you to do what Jonathan Ruffay did. Jonathan is in our community. He just surrendered to my... <clears throat> you know, he was looking for work that was available and he found out there was a job cleaning the visitation room. And he went to his case manager, very nice case manager who said, let me confirm that there's an opening, put in the request, he got it. In fact, his message said to me, I just went through A&O and, and, and got a job cleaning the visitation room. That's fantastic. A lot of new prisoners go to the kitchen. Now, when I went to prison and said the same thing to my case manager, she said, kind of nice try. All new prisoners go to the kitchen <laughs> for 120 days. And I said, I understand, but I tried. So as we talk about your first 30 days in jail, besides the obvious forming your budget, three, four, five hundred dollars a month, if they ask you to pay financial restitution or FRP, if you owe restitution, pay it, forming your primary contact, power of attorney, assessing who's going to get you to the prison, what time you're going to surrender, your book list. All of the things that you need to get out of the way before you surrender, within that first week, you should be walking around the compound looking for a job that interests you. 
like Jonathan did. He'll have 30 minutes or an hour a day cleaning the visitation room, you know, better than some jobs that could be seven or eight hours a day. There is downside, however, to getting a job that may be only 30 minutes a day. And I used to discuss this a lot with Michael. Scott or Scott Brown, can, can one of you enlighten me the consequences that can follow? There's this cliche, be careful what you ask for, you may just get it. What happens if you find a job in prison that, that's only 30 minutes a day? What is it, What could be a consequence of that, Scott Laney? The, the people I found who had jobs that were only 30 minutes a day, but were not self-motivated, they just spiraled downward. They they would sleep until lunchtime, sometimes noon, sometimes one in the morning. Then they'd stay up watching TV all night and they're they're snacking out of their locker at three in the morning, waking up the people that they sleep with. And then there's there's anger there. It's there's a certain responsibility that comes with it. Yes, it's it's a good idea to use your time productively, but you need to have a plan in place and you need to execute on it. Otherwise, you, before you know it, you go, how did I watch six hours of TV today? How, how did I just read a book? And I don't even remember what I took away from this. The time slips away and, and you start making bad decisions. So if you are lucky enough or you work your way into a job that's 30 minutes or an hour a day, I want to remind all of you, if you are not productive with the other 23 hours in the day, and if you sleep for eight hours, 15 hours in the day, and if you exercise for two hours, three hours a day, you got 12 hours left. Some people will literally feel like they're going insane, watching paint dry, counting the minutes until mail call, counting the minutes until Thursday night football starts. In fact, I remember seeing huge depression in prison the day after the Super Bowl. Oh my God, fo football is over. It's nothing to laugh at. It's true. They've been conditioned to wasting time, not all but too many. So I want to stress to all of you, if you're lucky enough to find a job that's 30 minutes a day, be careful what you wish for unless you're productive during the other window. And we're going to transition in a moment to do with those other hours. Some people, of course, want to work for eight or nine or 10 hours a day because it makes them feel busy. And I also recognize that not everyone is in a position to work 30 minutes a day because you may need to make more money in some jobs like Unicor that could pay you $150 a month or more. Also, credit that job qualifies for First Step Act credit. So I don't want to be insensitive to the fact that you may have to work more because you don't have money coming in. If you're in a position where you don't need to work, you have resources coming in, Assess, assess whether you want to spend eight hours a day feeling busy, going on the out crew where they reward you with McDonald's or barbecue, or if you want a job that's an hour a day and you have the rest of the time to prepare and think about it is what you're going to do. So we may not be able to control our bunk or our job. If, you know, occasionally in prison, they were doing like fire drills at two or three o'clock in the morning, the phones would go out time to time, email may go down, mail call may not be delivered on time, that would really set people off. Can't control that. You can control how you respond to it. And that is essential as you adjust in federal prison. Something our team encourages you to work on is your reputation or changing the narrative. If I were to ask you, well, let me ask you Scott Laney or Scott Brown or anyone, or Jason Larry, anyone willing to contribute, raise your hand if you fully agree with the government with the Department of Justice press release they issued. The DOJ <laughs> issued a release. They made me look like a, a mini Bernie Madoff, okay? Please. Does anyone here agree with the DOJ press release that was issued about them? Oh, my God. <laughs> right, this is enough to set everybody off, and we're going to shut down the webinar. I don't want that. But <laughs> So I share it because how many people... The lion's share of people in this community or who go to prison say, I didn't have bad intentions. I didn't mean to do it. They got the story wrong. They're sensationalizing my case to advance their career. My lawyer ignored me. I signed a plea agreement that was made up. That's not uncommon. The question is, well, what, what, what do you do? What's the response to that? Um, I have some ideas. Our team encourages you to rebuild your reputation by way of your reentry plan. And there are other avenues as well as we talk about the reentry plan. Some people like Scott Laney and myself created a website to document their journey through prison. And in a moment, I'm, I want to share Scott's site for a moment. Scott, can you talk a little bit about the website and the, the, why you decided that's something that you wanted to do and how that could have influenced staff while you were in custody? Yeah, of course. Interesting timing, because as you're saying, who doesn't who, who agrees with the Department of Justice press releases fully? And, and for me, I didn't really like the narrative surrounding what had happened. And I wanted to use my time away in a positive manner. 
but I was being a little vague about it. Sure, I'll read, I'll work out, I'll work on myself. And, you know, I got the idea from you guys to document this journey. And what really caught me off guard is when I came home, a lot of friends and family weren't asking how it was because they knew how it was and they were really just blown away by the journey and what I was able to get out of it. It, it motivated a lot of them to write more, to read more, to reflect more. And now that I'm back home, it's, it's really changed the dialogue surrounding what happened to me. Um, everyone wanted to discuss really nuanced aspects of my journey. They wanted to talk about the book reports that I wrote. Um, a lot of good friends and family actually started reading the similar books. We've had really good conversations about that. And overall, I just found a lot of value in, in writing both for myself and for people back home. It was it was a really good use of my time while I was there. It was something that, that kept me out of the TV room and kept me productive and centered. So I'll share with all of you, our goal is not to sell you a website. Our goal is to encourage you to decide how you can document your journey. There are great tools like Fiverr.com. You could have a, today's, it's nine o'clock right now in Los Angeles. You could have a website up by 11 o'clock for a hundred bucks. It's that simple. You should all also go to godaddy.com or somewhere and register your domain name, your own name, if it's available, because there are some wicked people out there, unfortunately, who will take pleasure in your pain and your misery. And I've gotten 10 calls over the years from people who said a victim registered my domain name. And when I go there, it's horrific, awful things about me. And I can't get it, my domain back because they own it. So it's a good exercise that you own your domain, even if you're not going to put anything up. But of course, by owning your domain and putting things up, Google is going to reflect that content because it's fresh content. So when someone Googles you, sure, they may read your DOJ press release. But on top of that, because you're continuing to add new content that's optimized by way of Google, your site's going to come up. So rather than running from it, or some people are exploited and stolen from reputation management companies, I was one of them. I wouldn't encourage it. The suppression, don't pretend this didn't happen. Don't pretend you didn't go to prison. That's not the straight A guide method. That's not our message of pretending it didn't happen. It's sharing what you've learned from it and how you'll become better. Keep those releases up. Don't suppress them. Own it. But talk about what you've learned from them and how you're contributing. And if you can do that, your URL will come up first. It will trump everything else. So some of you may be thinking, hey, I don't want to do a website or be that open all good, no problem. There are other mechanisms to share with your network and your eventual probation officer what you're doing. And that is core link, so the email system, which you will which will happen within the first 30 days. So Scott, what is the emails? What is core links in federal prison? Can you talk about the email system? How many contacts? How do you set it up? Sure, sure. Core links is basically the computers that you all will have access to. You can use them to email family. There's kind of a digital bulletin board that fills you in on the various things happening within the prison. There are some surveys that you need to take on there. If you've been on the webinars before, you've heard us speak about those. They're really important in regards to the First Step Act. So as an aside, when everyone gets to prison, one of the first things you want to do once you get access to the computer system is log on there and, and take any surveys that they have pending for you. You can email up to 30 people uh, on the website. I should say you can have 30 contacts. You can put in, I think, up to 100 people that you print mailing labels for. Most prisons don't allow you to simply write the address on there. You have to print a label, and that's done through Core Links as well. Um, it's a very basic, very bare bones system, but it's a great way to, to stay in contact with family and, and your network. So our team in, in, at prisonprofessors.com and the after sentencing have created, uh, we created a resource on how people can send you emails, also money, a whole host of issues in the prison professors after sentencing tab. Scott, if you can put a link to that resource page mm -hmm. as well. I share it because while you may not want to do a website and document your journey, a benefit to Coralink says you can email everybody at one time. So let's just say there's 30 people on your email list. You can just write one email and send it to everyone. And what some people in our community do is they'll write out what they've done the prior week. And it can be, frankly, it can be boring if you're doing nothing. If you just write what time you wake up and go to the chow hall and how much you exercise in time, people aren't going to read it. They're not going to be engaged. That's the reality. 
But if you're really holding yourself accountable and sharing lessons, people will look forward to this newsletter. Scott Laney mentioned, you know, people would, oh, I read your, your blog and what you did in prison. It was very inspiring. I learned it kind of changes the subject. So I'd encourage you either a website, a blog, or just every single week, once a week, send out to everyone, this is what I'm doing. And this is how I'm preparing to come home. This is a book that I read. Michael was in a federal prison speaking last week, and he shared a story. He asked a prisoner who's about to be released after 15 years, how many books have you read? And I think the prisoner said like 4,000 books, which is very impressive and inspiring. And Michael asked him, you know, how many book reports or have you written of those? He's like, well, I, I haven't. And Michael said to everyone, it's very inspiring that he's read 4,000 books. That's a big number. Then he asked people who here just surrendered to prison and some names went up, hands went up. And he said, I want you to learn from him. When you read a book, I want you to write why you read it, what you've learned from it and how it will help you after prison. Then he asked this prisoner about to be released. If you have 4,000 book reports, do you think that would influence a case manager or a probation officer or an employer or a lender or a landlord? And the answer was, yes, I wish I would have done that. Learn from that. So if you're going to go to prison, you have a book list and you can't recall what you've learned in the book, you might as well be watching a movie. So that is what you want to build into your release plan. That is what you want to be sharing with your network. That is what you want to be sharing with your probation officer from prison. It's all correlated through this mitigation arc. Creating content, trying to change the narrative, or you can be like so many people who call us when they're home from prison and say, I can't find a job. I'm struggling. That DOJ release has ruined my reputation. I don't know what to do. I got a bad rap. I should have gone to trial. And we look back on what they did in prison. It was a very unproductive journey or experience. And now they have regrets because everyone wants to get out early. I know some of you are on this webinar because you just want to get out of prison early because I see the texts that come in. What's up? Update on the First Step Act. Tell me more about RDAP and the year off. Tell me about the Second Chance Act. How do I get six months in the halfway house instead of three? How do I get a year instead of six months? We cover all of that, of course. I'm not naive. I know you want to get out. But if you're not ready to come home, what I don't want is you to be like so many of the dudes in the halfway house who are like, damn, I kind of wish I was back in the minimum security camp. They didn't approve my job in the halfway house. Now they want me to scrub toilets here. I wish I was back in the camp watching TV, hanging out and exercising. Be careful what you wish for. If you're not ready, whatever sentence you got amounts to kind of a life sentence in many ways if you're not ready to overcome it which is why in the first 30 days, you need to be ready. Wake early, become uncomfortable, do things that you might've never done before, like waking early while the dorm sleeps and plan your day. Cause come the afternoon, you may be too tired to do it. Let's talk, as we talk more about reputation and changing the narrative, I wanna talk about influencing your probation officer from prison. And something that Michael encouraged me to do was write letters to my probation officer. Uh, can anyone offer some insights on anyone to Frank or Gary or Jason or Kent or why would that be valuable to share insights with your probation officer who you may not even know who it is yet? What's the value of writing some letters from prison if someone would indulge me? One thing it's, it separates you from everyone else. Typically in prison, you're seen as a number, your inmate number. And anything you can do to humanize yourself with any of the, the decision makers is always a benefit. Thank you. Any other insights? Similar to Scott's stuff, Justin, I'd say you're separating yourself. Everybody else isn't going to write. They're going to say that nobody's going to read it or they're not going to listen to it. It's going to get thrown away. but. You know, what else are you going to do with your time? You might as well give it a shot and see if you can separate yourself from everybody else. So th thank you. I'm going to add on to that. Our team or Michael interviewed, as I've mentioned, a number of subject matter experts from Hugh Hurwitz, the former director of the BOP, to John Gustin, to Chris Maloney. And Chris Maloney mentioned the value, or Hugh discussed it as well, the, the value of, of a re release plan. And the release plan is a dynamic document. It's it's growing. So all of you should have the makings of your release plan created before you surrender to prison. And our team wants to help you. To that end, I will email you 
this release plan that Michael Santos created. And I'm going to email you a Word document to the release plan that Michael Santos created. And because of the First Step Act, this is more relevant than ever. When Michael and I were in prison, there were no real mechanisms to advance your release date. It was good time, which you really only got if you avoided trouble. Sure, the Second Chance Act passed in 2008, which could give you more halfway house time, but the First Step Act didn't exist. You've got to demonstrate why you're extraordinary and compelling. The release plan is an integral tool to that process. So people have said, I'm not, I'm not serving 26 years in prison. Michael Santos's release plan is overwhelming. Yeah, he did a lot. Do the best you can. It's better than nothing. You've got to start. And I encourage all of you coming back to pre-sentencing, if you don't like how you prepared for sentencing, you felt you could have done a better job of preparing for the PSR or your narrative articulating the message to your judge, own it, talk about it. Time and memorial compel, we feel differently looking back, share that, talk about it. So your release plan, which all of you should begin working on immediately, will kind of look like this. Right? It's going to include some very basic information, similar to how your, your pre-sentence report includes some very basic information. Name, information, your crime, things, do you owe money, where you've served time. But then it really gets, then it really gets into party time. Then it really gets into details that subject, subject matter experts have told us are appropriate. And included, John Gussert, Chris Maloney told us, Michael asked him, for someone who served 26 years in prison, what type of supervision would you expect that person to have? And Chris Maloney said, we would expect higher supervision because someone who served that long in prison probably doesn't have a job, probably doesn't have a network, and that could lead to a higher proclivity to commit crime and return to prison. Yet you look at the levels of liberty that Michael had, traveling, working with me, a convicted felon, teaching at San Francisco State, wasn't by accident. It's because he didn't tell he showed, he documented the journey. All of you have got to document the journey for your probation officer. If you want your job approved, if you want to travel, if you want higher levels of liberty, you want to get off probation early, you've got to document the journey or else you're like so many people who shake hands with the probation officer in prison and say, I did this in prison. You know what they say? Sure you did. Of course you did. Great. Move on with your day. You've got to show. So as you write out your reentry plan, be authentic. Describe your plans and goals for the future. Are you able to do that? Are you able to do that? Even some people who are in our community who never have to work again, thankfully, who are retired and have resources, that doesn't mean you don't have plans and goals for your future. Perhaps it's charity work, contributions, giving back, being a good mentor and role model, educating people. Just because you may not have to work again doesn't mean you don't have plans and goals for the future. But these are things you've got to create immediately, and then it's going to grow. So even the question of discuss your goals and plans for the future, some people have said, you know, I'm going to prison. I'm not thinking about that. If that's the case, be honest, be authentic, own it. But you do need to begin to lay out a vision. And it's a vision that will happen within the first 30 days of federal prison that will start with your case manager by way of a team meeting. Scott, can you quickly share what a team meeting is? Because it is going to happen within the first 30 days of surrendering to prison. It is. It, a team meeting is a... Once you show up to prison and then every six months thereafter, you meet with your case manager. Uh, the case manager's main job is, is in this instance is to do exactly as the name of the role and titles, manage your case. A lot of inmates get really excited about the meeting, thinking this is my time to get to know them and, and, and to ask to get out early and to ask the questions that every other inmate is asking them. Usually that's not well received. Most likely what they want to do is just have you sign a piece of paperwork saying you were at the meeting and then you move on. They'll have 10 to 15 reviews with inmates in maybe a 45 minute to one hour period. So it's imperative to put yourself in their shoes, right? Instead of all of us going, I wanna get out early, case manager, what can you do for me? You need to be able to show them what you're doing to make them look good. Are you participating in educational opportunities? Are you avoiding disciplinary fractions? Looking at a release plan like this, a case manager is thrilled going, I can put this person in for maybe more halfway house or home confinement time, and they're going to do fantastic. They're earning that spot at a halfway house because halfway houses are frequently full. So I think the big takeaway to summarize that is, is put yourself in their shoes and realize this is not a business discussion. This is not a meeting like we all had in our previous careers. 
You just need to put your head down, do the work and document what you're doing and the good things will eventually come. That, that, that's right. And also, as Michael wrote here, when memorializing your journey, please show as much as possible. Do not hide any incident report or infractions. There are people who only, people make mistakes in prison. People get written up for disciplinary infractions. It happens. It doesn't mean the consequence is losing good time or going to the hole. There are people in our community who went out of bounds by mistake for a moment, literally, to get a softball. They're playing softball. The softball went 50 yards outside the, the stick. And a guard said, hey, a correctional officer said, that's a disciplinary infraction. I'm going to write you up. You've done it three times. I told you two is too many. People who go into the, uh, the wrong dorm by mistake with a friend that's in there and they think it's okay. People get written up for disciplinary infractions. It doesn't mean you can't get off probation early or get the job that you like. We make mistakes in life. We're human beings after all. But what we don't want you to do is, is hide it. As Michael wrote, do not hide incident reports or infractions. There's someone on this webinar right now who doesn't want to be identified, who went to prison, went through RDAP, and he acknowledges the first three months he didn't give it his all. And the, the drug coordinator was very nice. He said, I think you could do more. I want you to do phase one over. And he did. He stayed in prison three months longer because of it, because he had to redo phase one. To this person's credit, he's like, I didn't give it my all. They held me accountable. Isn't that what the drug coordinator is supposed to do? Yes, he shared that message with his probation officer, articulating, I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. I learned from it. This is how I did better. I was best in my class. Be authentic, own it, don't lie, tell the truth. And if staff members helped you, which many frequently they do, articulate that message, articulate how they were of value uh, to you. So while our team is Somewhat, we encourage you not to spend too much time speaking with, with staff and fraternizing with them. If they're helpful, thank them, appreciate them, and share, share that message. But as Michael wrote, transparency and honesty go a long ways. If staff members influence your incarceration, I encourage you to document their services. So coming back to that first team meeting 30 days in, don't go on a whole sales shtick about what you're going to do in prison and this and that. Don't do that. Articulate to them, I am engaged in programming. I am grateful to be visiting with my family. I've been very productive here in prison. Then you are going to continue to build your reentry plan. That could include your narrative, character reference letters, what you're accomplishing in prison, book reports. And then how powerful are you if at the next team meeting, which could be three or six months later, Rather than telling them what you've done, and they may or may not believe you, they could think that it's happy talk, as Michael likes to say, you can actually show them. You can show them what you've done, like Michael did, what he did here, what he's accomplishing, what he's doing, how he's been growing his network, how he has job opportunities waiting for him upon his release, things of that nature, right? And here's Michael's release plan after he was released from prison many, many years ago, all of this. So as you're doing this work, think about the assets that you are creating. And that's how I'm gonna kind of wrap this up and then see if we have any questions. Many of you found our team. We didn't cold call you. We didn't solicit you. You found us because we created some piece of compelling content. It could have been an ad. It could have been a blog or a podcast. It could have been a free book we give away. But there was something online that compelled you to think, maybe these people can help us. Many people have thought we're doing these webinars to try to then sell you something, get on the phone with our team, try to get your credit card. Ain't the case, not the goal here. I run White Collar Advice, which proudly sponsors prison professors. We give all of it away for free. We created some piece of content that compelled you to join our marketing funnel and learn from us. Shouldn't you do the same thing? Shouldn't you too be creating content that can influence stakeholders, probation officer, judge? We have people in our community who write their sentencing judge from prison. Judge Carter in Santa Ana at a sentencing hearing tells defendants, I want you to come and see me when you're out of prison. I want to see how productive you've been. If you've done well, I'm going to let you off probation early. Is that a good deal? Deal, your honor. Think about that. You need to be creating compelling content. That's why as soon as this webinar is over, I think our team thinks, based on what subject matter experts think, you should begin creating your webinar, excuse me, creating your release plan. And it will build and grow and evolve. The narrative, letters, book reports, programming, how you've learned from them, employment opportunities, 
I will tell you, in addition to writing letters to your probation officer from prison, you should be nurturing relationships with employers. Because while you're in the halfway house, there is a lot of scrutiny. The halfway house may be walking around your employer. They may call several times. You may want to be an entrepreneur. If you haven't done the work, if you haven't cultivated those efforts, you're, the halfway house isn't going to approve it. So you need to have several jobs lined up. And all of that should be done, in our opinion, from federal prison. And you can do it with a pen and paper, through core links, good old snail mail. I mean, there are so many opportunities. But as we talk more about the first 30 days in prison, we believe what you do in that first 30 days sets the tone for the whole journey. And that's why you need to watch the webinars. That's why you need to engage with us. And I'll close how I opened. Can you spend 15 minutes a day listening to Earning Freedom? I think so. Can you spend 10 minutes a day listening to the interviews about the First Step Act and federal probation, how to get off early, how to potentially contribute and grow a business while in prison, things of that nature? I think so. But it's going to require work and a deliberateness each and every day through your surrender to prison and while you're in prison. And with that said, happy to answer any questions that people may have. And we're just super grateful that, uh, that you're here with us. So thank you. I think there are some questions along the right. Um, let's see. Let me take a look at this. I have a question about shots. My fiance is waiting on the write up about a shot he is facing. I have no idea what those are. Can someone discuss what a shot is? Scott or or Ken, Ken has Jason Brown. Can you uh, or Scott Brown? Can you talk a little bit about what a shot is? It's a disciplinary infraction. It's usually when a guard observes someone breaking the rules, or maybe they have been investigating something and they discover that someone's been breaking the rules, and it's a formal uh, write-up for a. a some sort of disciplinary infraction. Our team has done webinars and I'm very sorry to read that that's the case. Um, our team has done webinars on administrative remedy and how to respond to them, things of that nature at BOP.gov, the inmate handbook. For example, will you just go to any prison, I believe. Can you see my screen, everyone? Am I screen sharing? Uh, no. Forgive me. One moment. See, we all make mistakes. I'm sorry. I'll never do it again. I'll do better. Please continue to come back. Okay. So as we, um, the inmate handbook, this is, by the way, any prison you're going to, by the way, it's a good place to go and learn and inmate mail and money. And we cover a lot of that, but there should be a, a handbook here. And I believe the handbook, I'm not going to go through all of it now, um, will cover disciplinary infractions and kind of what they are. There's series level one, series two, series three, and series four. A series 400 shot could be as low, you know, running a business in prison as a 408 shot. A series 100 shot, the most severe, murder, tattooing, rape, escaping, pretty severe. A series 200 shot is a severe shot. There's no doubt about that. And it's essential that he respond appropriately and manage that because there could be real consequences from that, including going to the hole, loss of good time, some disciplinary infractions could lead to a new charge like iPhones. People think iPhones like, oh, big deal. I ran out of phone minutes. I called you know, for my daughter's graduation for three minutes. People are getting indicted for using an iPhone in prison. It's a new charge up to one year. And there are scores of these iPhones around federal prison. So I'd encourage you to learn more about uh, just life in prison. Call outs are on here. Of course, we cover that. Promissory money, contraband. So th this inmate handbook will go through them. But to answer your question, a series 200 shot is serious and it's something that he should respond to. Michael Santos and a lesson plan on administrative remedy suggested if the person did it, he would encourage that person to accept responsibility, say, I'm sorry, it won't happen again, rather than dodge and deflect and lie and blame if, the, if it actually happened. We're not lawyers, we don't know the specifics of the case, uh, but it's important that that person respond appropriately. And I'm sorry to hear that that he's going through that. I know it's I know it's not easy. Uh, let's see any other. And by the way, while you may not hear from him while he's in lockup because he may be in the hole and the, the consequence could be no phone <clears throat> or no email. So it's not uncommon that he could go dark for for a little while. And for that 
I'm sorry, we want to try to teach you how to advocate and prepare and avoid these scenarios and ensure it doesn't happen <clears throat> again. But I would continue to check BOP.gov because if he is transferred, it will say in transit and he may end up at a new prison. So these are things that we want to teach you to work through. Okay. Um, Michael, you, you had made a reference about creating a release plan um, and Michael Santos' uh, writing you had up on the screen, but what book what did that come from? Uh, the release plan that I shared with you, it's a book that Michael wrote. That That's something that, that was the PDF version of Michael's release plan. It has some introductory stuff at the beginning because it's something we're giving to people in our community. But after we get through the beginning, you're going to see the release plan that he created. As you know, our team doesn't ask you to do anything that we have not done. So Michael wanted to create this release plan as a template that you can learn from. And we'll send you the Word doc in PDF so you can begin creating yours. Oh, I actually started uh, collecting the books. So if, is there a book to purchase that that is within? Oh, sure. If, if you'd like, you know, everything we do here is free on, on the webinar. If you'd like to purchase a book, it supports our nonprofit. You can listen for free to the, the, the PDF or excuse me, the, the iTunes. If you wanted to purchase some of the books, there is a resource page on prison professors with all of our books. And as you're going through the system, I'd really re recommend well, there are several books. Michael, we have a book on the reentry plan, on, on the calendar, and documenting the journey. So, Scott, perhaps you can put up a, 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 the link to the resource page that includes the book, mm -hmm. and you'll be inspired. You'll learn, but you, you'll have a you'll have a clear plan on what to do. So, I I always recommend reading, reading Earning Freedom because it's the more macro story of Michael's journey, and then this book, My Eight Thousand Three Hundred Ninety Four Day in Prison, is great because it's just one day in his journey. So you get the, the micro and the macro and then going through some of our journals. I mean, imagine if you wrote a journal every day and you shared it with a probation officer, your network. And people have said to me, the probation officer is not gonna read the whole journal, maybe, but they can flip through it, see that you did it. So we want you to become content creators. We want you to change the narrative and write and our resources will help you do that. And it's something you should proudly share with your family, with your network. It just changes the whole dynamic of imprisonment. People go from, I'm sorry, you're there to you've inspired me. And I want to learn more from you. That's the case with Scott Laney. Thankfully, it was the case with me. And had I not met and learned from Michael, uh, I'd have been the dude that came home begging a friend for a job. Hey, man, give me a job. I got a raw deal. It wasn't my fault. What can I do? Didn't want to live that life. But all the books are there, Frank, for you to review and, and go through. Understood. And then with the one that you did throw up there uh, with regard to the uh, putting together the release plan, um, is the, do you have the title of that specific book? Uh, yes, I let me we'll, we'll put all of that up here. In fact, we can just go to the we can just go there. Let's just go there together. One second. Lovely. So we have earning freedom and we have the, uh, the iTunes, 141 episodes, awesome book. He did the same thing. So for those of you who don't have the resources to buy a book, that's okay. Michael did the audio one. They're on Audible now. They're, they're all here. Success after prison, how to adjust for success from prison. These journals and lessons are very helpful because it's a, a way for you to document your journal every single day. So there'll be a 2022 version, 2023. And Michael wrote, I wrote this book specifically for people in prison. Sometimes those people need prompts to work toward a successful return to journey. This is a book you can purchase on Amazon. There's the link, but it gives you an opportunity to write what you're doing every single day. And of course, Michael is a content writing machine. <laughs> Machine. Here are some books with Bill McGlashan, a venture capitalist, Massimo Giannulli from the Varsity Blues case. Moss chose to volunteer his time to our uh, community. He served five months at Lompoc for the very popular Varsity Blues case. Dr. Jeff Gallup's uh, an inspiration. Um, awesome. We've all learned from and spent a whole lot of time with him. Ear, nose, and throat doctor written about by the New York Times. Incredibly inspiring. This book is awesome and inspiring and in teaching people in jail and prisons. I mean, there's so much here and it can be overwhelming. But just like Michael taught me in prison, slow and steady wins the race. 10, 15, 30 minutes, 40 minutes a day before you know it, you're a master. So uh, whether it's the iTunes or you buy the book, you will be better for going through it. You have our word. Understood. If there's any other questions we're missing here. Someone asked about the PSR report when one goes to prison. How important is it? 
You will not surrender with your PSR report, uh, of course. And by the way, if you have cooperated, don't tell people in prison you've cooperated or had a 5K1, it's none of their business. Uh, you will not surrender with the PSR, uh, your probation report. However, of course, your case managers can have access to it because it will, it's, they're going to review it. That's why you need to be honest about many, any medical issues or ailments, any history of substance abuse or drinking. I think three days ago, I received a call from someone who didn't disclose their history of alcohol. Their lawyer uh, encouraged them not to disclose it for fear the judge would look um, poorly on him. And he got a longer sentence and he wants to correct the record. It's very hard to amend the PSR. So he regretted that. We don't, we, so it's a big deal. Your PSR will include your bunk, your job, your designation by the Bureau of Prisons. Uh, there are people who, uh, one of the first people our team worked with had an 18 month sentence and he got designated to a low security prison because in the probation report, the probation officer wrote that he had some affiliations with um, some organized crime earlier in his career. And that led to a designation. I know someone who had a six month sentence who was sent to a low security prison because he mentioned that he had suicidal thoughts, which many people do. And that disclosure compelled the, uh, the Bureau of Prisons to send him to a low to have a little bit more security over him. So everything you say in that interview really matters and it will follow you. And as Chris Maloney told us, the first thing your probation officer will do is look at your probation report. And if you're not pleased with the report, you got to correct it. You got to improve it or demonstrate, hey, I didn't get it at the time. I was still in denial. We just want you to be authentic. If there's one thing you take from our work, own it, be authentic, don't lie, create content to influence all stakeholders, both in and out of the system. So yes, uh, the PSR is a big deal and one that will follow you for your entire journey through the system. Do not take it lightly. And that was the PSR that was prepared pre-sentencing the final? Correct. That's right. Most of you who have already been sentenced, your judge probably asked you during the hearing, have you read the probation report? And you will have said, yes, your honor, though it's stunning how many people haven't read it, weren't prepared for it. Some actually go to the interview without their lawyer, which is scary. But yeah, it's a really big deal. And we've had, believe it or not, some success with people in our community actually working to get the PSR amended, thanks to some of the subject matter experts we hire. That's few and far between, but it can be done hard, no guarantee will be successful. But yes, the probation report will follow you for your whole duration through the system. And um, look, I know your eventual probation officer may call the probation officer that interviewed you. Tell me about this guy. He did a good job in prison. What, what was your expectation from him? Or what? tell me how I should feel about this guy. I have nothing to go on. I don't know what he did in prison. All I have is his PSR. If you're not influencing that person, who are they going to believe? They're going to believe their colleagues who wrote the probation report. They're going to believe the Department of Justice's press release, of course. <laughs> so yes, not to be changing the narrative and creating content, sharing it, having fun with it. It can be a great experience, as crazy as that sounds. I know you don't want to be there, but I don't want you to come home and think, I wasted the time. There's a whole new set of problems waiting for me on the other side. Create, create, create. No, I'm looking at things positively, and I'm glad that you clarified that. Um, I think that if I looked at it from a personal perspective, that the PSR report and subsequently working with that officer, for me, was a positive experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it was taken into mind um, very significantly. You know, by the sentencing judge, Judge Lyman in New York. Um, uh, even though I live on the West Coast uh, here. Um, but yes, I, I get it, what you're saying. And then subsequently, are there opportunities to get in touch with you, stay in touch with you? Are you talking about with our team? You you personally, yes. Yeah, that, that's some. I know we've had some emails. That's something that we can d d discuss next week. Our team does these webinars. We want to give away as much, as much information as we can. Some people may work with our team individually and get support throughout the whole journey, communication via email and phone and meetings and whatnot. So let's, we can, do, I know you're unavailable until Monday, so we can discuss that then. I'm happy to do that. I know we, we've had some emails, but I want to share something that that Frank said that's crucial. So he had a faith. And, and Justin, I'm available to you or your team 24 seven. I think that this is essential to the journey. At least that's what I've Thank you so far. Thank you. And I want to share something that you said, everyone listening. So he had a favorable outcome at sentencing, favorable in that he influenced his probation officer 
in, in a good way. And from what I've heard, and the relationship was solid. Well, so he's already built that foundation, similar to Kent, who built that foundation leading up to sentencing. Frank's job, Kent's job, is to continue to prove worthy of that, to build upon that. So if you've gotten off to a great start, you don't want to stop. You want to continue to develop that in prison by the website or the book. Some people write the book or the blog or the core links email. Um, some people don't even want to do the core links to their network. Fine, at least write your probation officer, share the reentry plan, because you're going to be home and, and you want that job approved. You're going to want to travel. We've had people in our community get off probation early. Nate Schott, who frequently joins our webinars, a dentist from Tennessee, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, sentenced to 33 months, home in about 10 months. He just got off probation after 21 months, and he still owes restitution. You know what people in prison will tell you? You can't ever get off probation early if you owe money. Well, Nate Schott just did. It wasn't by accident. He contributes to his community. He gives back. He's traveling. I live in Orange County. He's been to Irvine like nine times, I think, since he's been on probation. It wasn't by accident. Prove worthy of it, create content, and share it. Then you, it's you know, and actually, Nate, I'm going to have Nate speak next week. He's doing better than ever because he does training for dental offices and he's really able to show the consequence of making a bad decision. What happens if you get lazy with your books? What happens if you don't train your team properly? What happens if you respond poorly to a government investigation? So now he's like developed me in a compliance business for dentists immersed in this system. He's like, I'm making more money than I ever was because of my experience through prison. Aha, he cracked the code that perhaps one of his biggest assets. It's his time through the system. It can be one of your greatest assets as well, but not by accident. It's going to require work. So, Frank, I commend you for building that good record. Just keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. No, it, it's funny, Justin, because I, I, I'm sorry, it's not funny. None of this is funny. But on the other hand, I just stumbled onto kind of doing things correctly per your guidance and your um literally divine intervention here and, and thank you for this um but it seems that by sheer coincidence i've started doing things correctly even having my own website and and yep. stuff like that and one of the things that did come up in sentencing with judge lyman who was quite compassionate honestly um uh, and, and, you know, it was difficult for him to make the decision that he made, you know, went out of the courtroom and into chambers for half an hour, you know, before he came back. And I was told that that's pretty unusual. Um, but on the other hand, when he came back, one of the things he did interject was, I'm not going to put any prohibition to your professional practice when you come back. Okay. Um, so at least that gives me something to at a minimum, be hopeful for. Um, and then after putting four decades into professional practice, at least you have something to be hopeful for to come back to. But then, you know, again, working with you and your team personally is how do you set that up to stay alive? How do you set that up so that nobody touches it? Mm -hmm. um, how do you set that up to stay in touch with people um, so that you can come in on a glide slope to what is hopefully going to be a good landing and starting to think about not so much of, of course there's fear, fear, fear going in, but start thinking about out, out, out. Okay. Um, and what are you going to do um, already? Okay. I, I agree with everything you you've said, and there's a lot to, we'll go through some of those specifics in future webinars when we speak, I love that you have the website. I love that you're upbeat. I love that you want to document the journey. And you notice, I'll tell you what I love what Frank said as much as anything. It wasn't, I know he wants to get out of prison as quickly as possible. We all do. But it wasn't, what can I do to get out in three months or four months or five months? Here's the irony. The work that we're teaching you to do to advocate and to create a record and avoid problems has a higher likelihood of getting you what you want, which is an earlier release. So some people just fixate on what can I do to get six months in the halfway house? What can I do? Uh, you know, if they fixate on that, they tend to get away from the process or work to get there. So Frank, the decisions that you're making, the reading, the documentation, avoiding problems, puts you on the path to get what it is I know you want back home to your family. And we're just going to chip away at that every single week. Someone asked about rental properties and assets in our preparing to surrender webinar we discussed. 
having a point of contact, potentially a power of attorney, that you are able to discuss things like, you know, rental properties or business, excuse me, personal affairs. My suggestion is, and this requires a much longer conversation, I'll do a very short summary of it right now. Be cognizant of everything you say. Think about the best ways to communicate. If you're going to visit and have eight hours together alone, could some of these things be discovered in a visit? Probably. If it's so urgent, can you send a letter and maybe that your loved one gets the letter a day or two later? Yes, they can read the mail, but it's not recorded or it's not made a copy of like they do an email that's recorded or a phone call that's recorded. Worst case scenario, you can send an email or phone, but I want you to assess the urgency of it. If there's an issue with the rental property, yes, you can discuss personal affairs, but is it easier to wait for a visit or to send a letter? So I want you to think about those things, but having a power of attorney, having a primary point of contact is a good idea to manage these sort of affairs. So you're not blowing through phone minutes, getting stressed out, someone's late on the rent and how are we going to serve a three-day notice and have a power of attorney, have a point of contact to manage those things. That's all part of preparing properly. Kent, I see your hand up. Is it still up? Yep. So right. I appreciate all that stuff. So mine's, um, obviously I'm surrendering here on the 27th. My question is I've watched these webinars in the top 10 list to do before you surrender. Those are kind of the big, big concept things. I guess my question is, is do you have, or I guess I'm looking at it now as there's been so many little things about priority to go, like mailing myself, my contact list, um, getting funds potentially sent to my commissary, like by myself mailing to me. Is there a maybe a checklist of you know we, seventy two days before or seventy two hours before you go, forty eight hours before you know, kind of a maybe a hit list of some of that stuff. Certainly, we and I think maybe we'll touch on this next week because a lot of people um, on this webinar are getting ready to to go to prison in the in the new year. We will. We have the, um, we have it. We we have the top ten, and we really get specifically into every single one. So to answer your question, um, we'll cover that next week. And I know you're not going in. Just actually, are you going to head in on this? Is it the seventeenth or twenty seventh? Twenty seventh. Okay, so we'll touch on it next week. But you will form a contact list. I surrendered with it. If they don't let it in, you'll just mail it to yourself and. Um, We'll go through that. I think that's a good idea. And in fact, I discussed with Carol and Michael kind of starting over from scratch with our webinars, going back to number one, starting with preparing for surrender, and then transition into disciplinary infractions and <laughs> all of that. So give us till next Friday and Saturday and we'll cover it. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, any other questions that we have that we have missed? Of course, we're always so grateful that you choose to come to these webinars and it's growing. Yesterday we had more than 60 people on today at uh, 30 or 40, which is great. And we're going to continue to continue to do them. We're so grateful that you're here. Short of that, um, make sure we've answered everything. Now we have people coming into the webinar right as we're wrapping up. Let's see. I think we've answered all of the questions. If any of you have suggestions on what you'd like us to cover, email us. If you have questions you'd like us to answer, email us. You know our team is responsive. You know that we're here and we know we wanna, we wanna teach you. So with that said, I'm gonna close with how I opened. I'm begging you, slow and steady wins the race. I'll never forget Michael Sanchez telling me that as we walked the track. He said, dude, you're overwhelmed. You don't know where to start. Spend 15 minutes a day doing the right thing then build up to 30 in an hour. And before you know it, I was working alongside him 12 hours a day in that quiet room. Do the same thing. Go listen to Earning Freedom. Go start on your release plan. Go listen to the subject matter experts. Come with questions, learn, and we'll always be here to help you. That said, very grateful that you're here. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you next Friday. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.